All right. Uh, thanks for having us. We are talking about uh, our, the title of our session today is Empowering Transitions, Accessible Education Materials, Paving the Way for Blind Students. Uh, we spend a lot of time supporting blind students in, in K-12 and, and uh, there is sometimes not quite as much information as we would like about the transition process. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity um, to kind of share our insights. Um, we're going to get started with some introductions. Uh, my name is Michael Cantino. I am the blind uh, visually impaired uh, technology specialist out of Northwest Regional ESD. Uh, I support students and teachers across the state. Um, I'm also a braille transcriber on a couple STEM literacy initiatives. And I was previously an accessibility specialist at Portland Community College. Um, I'm going to let my co-presenters introduce themselves, uh, starting with Patricia. Hi, everybody. Patricia Kepler, she for uh, pronouns. Um, I also come to you as an accessibility specialist from Portland Community College. And I'm actually um, I'm a blind person myself. I went through school, uh, well, low vision and then transitioned right into blindness. Good morning. I am JJ Isaacson. I am the blind and visually impaired uh, math TOSA. I'm a teacher of students with visual impairments with uh, Northwest Regional ESD. I'm the statewide math TOSA for uh, students that are blind and visually impaired. And uh, I have experience as well at the community college level as uh, being an instructor for adult basic education uh, math coursework and uh, dropout retrieval programs for math coursework, as well as working for Portland State University for the College of Education and prepping teachers with math methods for teaching students that are blind and visually impaired. Great, thank you. Uh, so I was really excited about um, doing this session with JJ and Patricia. I thought we had uh, a nice kind of breadth of experience from uh, K-12 to higher ed and Kind of working both sides and and Patricia having that lived experience as well. Um, so hopefully this is helpful information for you all as we get started. So a uh, quick rundown of the things we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about the commonly used accessible formats um, that blind and low vision students are typically using. We're going to talk about uh, the importance of having some strong technology skills uh, as you get started for uh, in higher education, there's gonna be a lot of online content. We'll talk a bit about some of the new challenges that students will face as they move into higher education and how the accommodation process differs um, in K-12 versus higher ed. And we'll also outline some important staff roles that students should be aware of um, so they know who they can go to for support um, during their college career. So before we get into talking about accessible education materials, I thought it would be helpful to have a quick definition uh, so that we're all on the same page. And I really like um, this definition that CAST shares on their website. Uh, it's from a joint letter of uh, the Department of Justice and the Department of Education here in the US. So the definition they use uh, is says the education materials and technologies are accessible to people with disabilities if they're able to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as people who do not have disabilities. As a person with a disability, you must be able to achieve these three goals in an equally integrated and equally effective manner and with substantially equivalent ease of use. Um, so, I thought that, that was uh, a great definition that kind of captures all the different aspects of this. Um, and so when we're thinking about accessible education materials, we wanna be able to kind of access the same things and use them with the same level of ease and get them at the same time as our peers. So we're really kind of engaging with things in uh, an equally integrated and equally effective manner. All right. So I'm gonna take my own advice and try and spread things out. We've got some time. Uh, what aid materials are blind and low vision students commonly using? I have a list here on the screen. Um, and the very first thing here is digital documents. 
So um, we are kind of, as education is shifting more and more to electronic materials, we're all kind of seeing a lot of digital documents. Uh, but these digital materials are going to play a huge role in your coursework in higher ed. Um, so if you are somebody who is using digital documents now in high school, um, but you're kind of um, not super comfortable with them, it is well worth your while to spend some time um, getting comfortable using digital documents, finding tools that help you do that effectively, um, because this is the bread and butter of uh, higher education and in particular, how we can offer accessible education materials um, in higher education. Digital documents are really flexible. They work with a lot of different assistive technologies and they are typically one of the fastest things for us to turn around and make available for students. Um, usually these are what instructors are kind of primarily handing out um, over print materials these days. So it really behooves students to uh, build up some strong skills to, for working with digital documents. Okay, I wanted to spend a bit of time on that because it is kind of hugely important. But other, uh, other formats that we see blind visually impaired students using, large print. Um, so in this instance, we're talking about large print paper materials, uh, digital materials, you can kind of really adjust your font size and your colors really easily. With large print materials, that's a little tougher. Um, so something to keep in mind, if you're somebody who needs a particular font size, you really like some of those color contrast options. Um, digital documents can be a little more flexible there. Large print can kind of have some limitations about how you're accessing those, accessing those materials, where you're accessing those materials, depending on where you have tools available. Audiobooks is a common format that we see students using. Um, having Being able to listen to your textbooks makes a big difference, particularly for students who experience a lot of eye fatigue or eye strain uh, for, after reading uh, visually for long periods. So audiobooks are great. Um, here I'm kind of distinguishing between uh, audiobooks with human readers, uh, because otherwise we're using digital documents to use things like text-to-speech tools to have that kind of synthetic speech. Audiobooks are really great. Um, a lot of students really love using these materials. It can be a little difficult to get your hands on particular titles with audiobooks. So uh, while all audiobooks are really excellent and you can have them in higher ed, uh, you can request them as a format. Um, it does still kind of a good idea to get familiar with a text-to-speech tool. So uh, I have that a conversation a lot with students, had that conversation a lot with students when I was at PCC. Um, if you don't quite like that synthetic speech and you're having a hard time listening to it, um, it's worth kind of spending some time with it and kind of getting used to it, finding a voice that you like um, because getting access to audio materials from a digital document is kind of easier to get your hands on than a specific audiobook for your title. And then tactile materials. So for blind users, um, this would be like Braille, tactile graphics, which would be essentially like Braille drawings, uh, and then digital Braille files if you'd prefer to read on Braille display. Um, but these can be hugely important. Um, and there are scenarios where you really want these tactile materials um, over something like a digital document. And then finally, audio descriptions for, for video content. There will be a lot of video and content that you encounter in your education career, um, and not all of it is effectively described. And that is something that you can request and ask for folks to provide to you. Um, and if it is not kind of a truly audio described video, they at least need to provide you with some form of access to that content. Uh, again, kind of in that spirit of the definition of accessible education materials, something that you can utilize in an equally effective um, and uh, with the same level of ease of use. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat yet, I'm gonna move on. So AIM, in uh, AIM is accessible education materials in K-12 versus higher education, there's a lot of similarities, um, but it's important to keep in mind that you don't have the same kind of um, team around you in higher ed that you do in K-12, where people are kind of proactively um, advocating on your behalf and seeking out kind of solutions for you. 
it is really important that you kind of have a strong grounding in what materials you like to work with, why they work well for you, so you can advocate for um, those materials. So it's important to know um, what, what formats you really like and why you like them. So you can let people know um, that I really do need an audiobook for this course, or I really do need these tactile materials here, and just listening to it is not gonna be sufficient. Um, knowing why materials work well for you is, is really important as you're navigating these conversations in higher ed. Um, it's also good to think about not just what materials will work well for me, but what materials will work well in different environments. So you might be somebody who really likes to work with uh, paper large print materials, but maybe in your lab classes, you don't wanna have a big book of large print with you. Uh, maybe a digital document's a little better. You don't need the clutter of like a CCTV or um, other devices around in the lab um, kind of getting in your way. So not just thinking about what do I prefer uh, kind of uh, generally, but also when I'm in different environments, what's gonna work well if I need to study at home versus on campus. And you may also need to be thinking about um, what materials are gonna work well for different subjects. So maybe an audiobook is really great for your literature course, but maybe it's not so great for your math course where you really want that braille notation or you really need the paper copy of the large print or something to work on those solutions. So we're thinking about where we're using the materials and kind of subject specific stuff that might impact what materials work well for you. And then uh, finally, we're always thinking about timely manner. Uh, it takes time to prep these materials and you really have to keep on top of that. You need to be kind of in close contact with the, the disability services office to make sure everybody is uh, kind of exchanging materials in a uh, efficient way and staying on top of things because it does take time to make materials accessible, um, particularly if you need to make them in these different formats. So you need to be thinking ahead and um, kind of planning for that prep time as you're trying to get your hands on these materials and working with um, the college staff on that. Okay, finally, before I hand it off to JJ, assistive technology is huge. Um, you're gonna be using this a lot while you're at college. And uh, the first thing here is we need to be thinking about what operating system you're going to be on. Uh, it can make a big difference. I would say personally for me, when I was in college, I. Uh, had several instances where I needed to install specific applications on my computer. That's something that you might not be able to do very well on something like a Chromebook. Um, it doesn't mean those things won't be available to you, but you may have to be going onto campus to access uh, like a lab computer or something. And so you need to think about um, those kinds of things. Will I be able to install the AT that I need? Will, be, will I be able to install other applications that I need for a course? Um, you should really have a plan for how you're going to access digital content and have a good understanding of what tools are working well for you and why. Um, we're going to be, you're going to be working with so much digital content at the higher ed level, even if you are on campus and taking uh, classes in person, you still may be working in a learning management system online. You're still going to be like grabbing a lot of files uh, from Google Drive or something shared from your instructors. So you need to have really strong internet navigation skills. You need to have a really good comfort level with working online and with digital content. Um, it's also helpful to have an understanding of a good enough understanding with your tech that you know when something's going wrong and you have some ideas about how you're going to troubleshoot that. That can be really helpful um, as you are kind of advocating for your needs with staff and you can say, oh, I know this was a, something with my AT, but this is kind of a bigger issue with how this document was provided to me. So having that understanding can be really helpful. And then uh, schools are required to provide AT to assist you in accessing materials, but there can be some minor variations there. Um, there are kind of different ways to achieve um, providing you with uh, the AT needed for access. And um, it is an interactive process. We'll, you'll probably hear us talk about that a lot throughout this presentation. Um, there can be a back and forth. So an example might be, 
um, you were in high school and you were using a Chromebook and um, you really liked to read and write. And as you were getting ready to go to college, you decided you're going to use an iPad instead. And read and write doesn't really function the same way on the iPad. Um, the school may not just go out and buy you a Chromebook and say, well, here's read and write and get you a read and write subscription. Um, they might say, well, you have an iPad. Let's show you how to use similar functions on the iPad. Um, and that would kind of achieve the same uh, goal of being able to use the kind of similar tools to have the same end, um, but it may not be exactly what you were using previously. That said, if it doesn't work for you, it is an interactive process, and that is something you can go back and forth with, um, with disability services, with your instructors, to make sure that the supports that are being provided really do work well for you uh, in an effective way. Okay, with all that said, I'm going to pass this off to JJ, and we're going to talk about um, getting ready for transition from the K-12 side of things. Check in the chat super quick, too. Um, we had uh, Chandra say earlier, well, Deborah did say you must be uh, the advocate in your higher ed, which is a nice transition for me for this slide. But uh, just before, uh, after that, uh, Chandra said, when I first learned about the ease of use concept, the example I heard was that it should not take a student with a disability four hours to consume material that takes their peers one hour to consume. So thank you for that comment. That is definitely what we would like to strive for. It's, uh, I don't, it, it's not po always possible or we still have to think in terms of with students with their blind and visually impaired. And I talk with my students about this a lot that it it does take longer to do things. Um, but if we can we can get that down and, and get that closer to our peers, um, that would be ideal. And Deborah said timely manner equals the same time as their peers to remind us of that. Um, and the OEM co uh, AEM cohort has chosen to focus on self-advocacy. So these are all great segues to this particular uh, part of the presentation. Um, where I come in and I was asked to be part of this team is just my experience working directly with students that are blind and uh, visually impaired. I was a math instructor at the Washington State School for the uh, Blind for junior high and high school kids, mostly high school kids. And I would uh, help them. Uh, we would work a lot in classes and prepping to move on to college um, and what it was going to be like for them in college, in the college environment. And as well now as an itinerant, I work with students and I work with teams that work with students. And as they approach that you know, junior, senior year of high school and considering, hey, I want to go to college. Um, we are, uh, you know, Michael and I have teamed up as well as now with Patricia in supporting these students in in kind of what I like to call college boot camp kind of thinking, um, prepping them to get ready for this transition. And with that, you know, the first bullet point on this slide is, you know, kind of what to expect and one of the biggest thing is to plan for the rigor, the increased rigor. And as Deborah, you said that, you know, earlier in the chat comments, you know, getting our students to realize that there is no, no child left behind in college. That's what I tell them. They're, they're on IEPs now and we follow IDEA and we have all this whole team of folks and adults around them, making sure that these things are happening for them. And when they go to college, with it switches now to ADA, but they are now their own TSVI, right? Their own advocate. So helping them prep for that and expecting that, as well as I talk to them and work with them, work with the teams that work with them about, and we want to work if you know with when you're connected with these students, if you're one yourself or if you're connected with a team of folks that work with these students, is really working on preparing them for the increased rigor. And that, uh, you know, math 111 in college is basically an entire year of high school algebra in 10 to 12 weeks. And so helping them to understand that and that you're probably only going to go to class two or three times a week and you're going to have to have a plan. And what is that going to look like and how many classes might you decide to take that first term? And maybe you might decide to step down a class um, you might test into, you know, calculus one because you did all this math through high school, but maybe it might be a, a, an idea to step down one class and take that pre-calc in college, like that math 112 or whatever they're calling it nowadays, 
and get used to that rigor, get used to that speed and expectations uh, for, for the academics in that world. And then working with students to build their skills, as Michael has commented with, especially like the text to speech uh, and listening to that, uh, you know, digital, you know, computer voices and getting good at those synthesized voices so that you have access to the materials in a digital way. So really continuing to beef up those technology skills and supporting that um, <clears throat> and, and the different computer systems. And as Michael mentioned, you, you might, you know, you're going to have to be able to troubleshoot those or know where you need to go to troubleshoot those tech skills. Of course, with orientation and mobility, and Patricia will probably speak to this as well uh, um, from her career and from her personal experience, but continuing to really beef up those O&M skills um, and possibly if they know where they're going to school, start working on them there if it's if it's a local uh, location to where they're going to school now. Um, and also I worked with my students on this in my class, but to suggest to teams that work with students to start practicing working with a reader and a scribe if they haven't already, some of them have experience with that. But oftentimes in the high school, you know, in the K through 12 system, the reader and the scribe is a little more um, helpful, um, not necessarily that we like them to be, but a little more helpful with our students than than they probably should be where they can kind of anticipate and they know the student, they're like a communication partner. So they know the student and they know, you know, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I know what to write. I know what to read, or they've been doing it a long time with them. Whereas on a remind my schools, I have my teachers, my students that, uh, and the teachers that work with them, when you head off to college, I, I would work with my students in pretending I would role play with them that I am a liberal arts lit major that is working on work study and I have been assigned to be the scribe for this student in in calculus class and I'm only going to be able to write down what you tell me because I have no idea what I'm doing in calculus class so getting students to be really specific and descriptive with what they need written down um, and read back to them. So practice that if they know that that's something that they're going to request and want to use in the college setting. And this all comes back full circle to, you know, the whole self-advocacy piece and really working with our students to understand what works really well for them and how it helps them. And as Michael said earlier, like different classes, you might realize like I need I need a, different things um, what works for me in, in chem class or math class is going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to have maybe something different that I want for my my social studies classes, my li my literature class, my humanities classes. Um, so learning those and getting really adept at being able to explain those and advocate, self-advocate for those and communicate what you need and kind of deduce those down. Um Next slide, I believe, is now we are on to planning ahead. So with all that said, um, there's resources for our students to plan ahead for this. And the biggest one is the Oregon Commission for the Blind. And they start, uh, students can start working with them at the age of 14. And even, um, even students that might not qualify completely for the Oregon Commission for the Blind when they do become an adult, but they have um, vision, they're vision eligibility with special education, uh, they can still start working with them at 14 to learn skills with access to technology and training and and in social emotional support. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to be like, oh, well, you're not legally blind. And so you can't work with us. They encourage all students that are eligible for vision to work with them at age 14. That being said, though, if when they do transition to college and if they are um, eligible as legal blind to work for the Commission for the Blind, then now they're going to be working with them and OCB is going to work with them with the act more support with access to technology and training and prepping to be ready for college and through college, as well as help with funding for going to school, which is and 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 support there to just, you know, kind of stay, stay accountable and working with getting through a school program. Also, it's highly recommended, and I work with my students and work with their teams, that 
they start just as our sighted peers. You you start looking at the schools that you want to go to with our students being really purposeful about, okay, I'm interested in these schools. And one of the first places I'm going to check out is connecting with the disability services office with these schools to understand what the accessibility is for them available at that institution. And that feels like it's going to work for them. And I have anecdotal experience with many students where it was very helpful to do that, you know, way ahead of time to then help them start making decisions. They thought, oh, I, I really wanted to go here. And then the disability services um, was not what it didn't feel like it was going to meet their needs and, and be as accessible for them as they had anticipated. And so that helped them choose differently around the schools that they need to go to. But also connecting with them once they do decide way ahead of time, just as Michael said earlier, it's about timing. The disability services needs the time in order to prep, to, to connect, you know, get these materials, get materials ready, get connected with instructors and so forth. So um, that's really important uh, to get that all started ahead of time before headed off to school in fall, be talking to disability services in the spring and the summer uh, beforehand. So um, lots of for students to spend senior year, but if they can start really working on it that junior year, it's it's super important. And to be really involved, to encourage any teams or students that you work with or you know, for them, for the student to be very involved in their IEP process, especially that junior and senior year. And the students that I've worked with personally on my caseload, they are um, they are help they are mostly writing their IEPs with me. Um, and their goals and their accommodations and that junior senior year we're really thinking about like how those need to be written so that they when they go to college with that document I get them to realize it's not going to be a guarantee that you're going to get all these but they're going to understand what you've been using in college and it's going to be very helpful for you to advocate what you're going to need in the college situation and also it really preps them to run their own IEP meetings and to be to be that advocate, to be that self-advocate that they need to be um, when they head off to college. So I'll end there with that and we'll move on to Patricia's section. Hello everybody. So getting started, um, first I'll just have a little bit about what was said because it's, can't say it enough. Um, being prepared, knowing what's available to you is so important and, and knowing what tools that you might use. Um, wayfinding, uh, looking at different apps because I'm just going to, my own personal experience when I started working at PCC, four different campuses, and I reached to the out to the Commission for the Blind thinking that they would be able to get no an person out there to help me learn those campuses, and they kind of chuckled and said, you know how busy we are, Patricia? <laughs> so um, so I, I invested in uh, the IRA app, actually, for a while, and when I got on campus, you know, click onto that app and say, hey, can you help me find this building uh, while I learned? Going on their own. So that was what I used. Some colleges actually have IRA available. PCC doesn't, um, although it's something I've been continuing to advocate for. Um, but I know that some of our universities do. So that's like one, that is definitely one of those questions that students, when they're doing that, that look as to what colleges they want to go to, um, as JJ said, reach out to the Disability Services Office find out what they have, what's what's available. Do they have something like IRA? What kind of wayfinding support have they in place already? What do they recommend? Um, sorry, the, the chat kind of distracted my ears. <laughs> the, um, wait a second, my back. Um, but yeah, and, and think about more than just that, because as all of us know, college, is a lot more than just education, right? We are more than an accommodation. There's so much and that that the able-bodied other students get to participate in sports, theater, all of those things. Find out what efforts the school has made to make the school uh, inclusive and welcoming to people with disabilities. Uh, in my role as accessibility specialist at PCC, that was one of the things I focused on. So they now have audio description with their theater, They've worked on making uh, the different arts programs uh, more inclusive and accessible for, for the community to come and check things out uh, because it's, it's it's a community college. That's what it should be doing. So that's that's one of those questions students should be asking 
when they are considering where they're going to go to college. Um, Rights under the ADA, 504 Act, I mean, that, that ensures we all have equal education. You all know that law, I'm not gonna go through too much into that, but that's where you have the right to ask, you know, what, what, do you, what are you guys done to invest in, you know, to make sure I have a welcoming place to go. Um, the accommodation process has been mentioned, it's different at the college level in high school, uh, you know, group of people behind the scenes are helping make those decisions for the student at the, at the college level. They meet with a um, practitioner who talks with them about their abilities, finds out where their barriers are, and recommends accommodations. Uh, PCC uses AIM. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of the colleges in Oregon use that same system. Um, so once a student has been connected, they have an account, they go online. Every term after they've registered for classes, it is their responsibility to sign in and check that they want those class accommodations in those classes and say which ones they want. For example, um, you know, if they're taking a PE class, they might not want alternative testing, so they wouldn't request it for that class. So, but it, it lets them personalize what they want for each class. Um, which is really important. Uh, one thing that I have seen um, in my years at PCC um, with transitional youth in particular, sometimes they have they really struggle with connecting with our office, and it could be a number of reasons. One reason I've heard from many students is that at the K twelve level, level, where kids can be pretty cruel and uh, heartless, they felt othered. They felt uh, like they weren't you know, part of the community because of their accommodations. So a lot of students will be resistant to reaching out and getting those accommodations uh, because they want to finally be part of the community. So supporting them with that, recognizing that that harm has been done, but letting them know that this is different, this is confidential, and the only one that's going to know is them. We're not going to be, you know, putting a flag above their heads saying this kid gets accommodations. Nothing is, is going to be public. Um, getting the, uh, Michael pretty much covered uh, accessible materials and uh, content, but you know, sometimes the, even though you've got the request out there, they get to the classroom and the teacher hasn't quite figured it out. So they can always circle back to our offices um, and, you know, say, hey, I really need this help. We, schools have people dedicated to to all formats. Um, so if they got the materials, like for example, um, they got an audio book but it didn't work right or a PDF that didn't open right, they can reformat it to make it work for the student. Uh, I wanna cover that as well because one thing that is important as Michael mentioned, learning to adapt to different technology. Um, one reason why that is important is the college level, there's, there's that whole citing requirement, right? You have to do the APA format and you're you read audible books, they don't give you page numbers, they don't give you chapters. Um, so being able, even if you're primarily reading it through audible, having that experience to go in through the PDF or whatever, to get that appropriate page number, find that passage so you can cite it properly through your classes is, is hugely important. Um, lost my thing, where did it go? What's the next slide, Michael? Yeah, the last that we had wayfinding was the last one on this one, and then we're just talking about roles at the college. And if there's, is there anything you want to add about wayfinding, or do you just want to dive I into? I covered it. Just like I said, knowing your favorite app via, you know, uh, Lazarillo or uh, Google Maps or whatever, um, or more personal ones like Be My Eyes and Ira. Um, finding the tools that are gonna help you or creating little braille maps. Um, a lot of schools do that. Uh, Michael did a lot of that, making 3D maps at PCC for students to carry around with them uh, to get where they need to go. So most your offices will, will do some, some initial uh, familiarity for students um, to help them get where they need to go. Um, I know that it, <laughs> Sorry, Michael, the chat just commented on your talents. 
It's not your picture shit. I only have so many ta talents. We'll see. It can't interrupt us too much more. Uh, let's let's uh, dive into roles at the college. Ah, if I could find it on my screen, can you? I can't read it. It's not. That's reading totally it. fine. So uh, we have we have a list here. So student, I think, is a given, right? Uh, instructor, it. disability services. Testing centers, in particular, thinking about extended time, readers and scribes, um, yes. note taking and in-class aides. So we're thinking yes. about kind of how all these connect to each other. I'm so sorry. I you know, Once I said it, I no said, worries. oh, there it is. The heading came back. It jumped around it earlier. OK. Ah, the problems with JAWS and technology when you're in the middle of a session. <laughs> so yeah, so the, I mean, all of these these things play that part in the student's life. You know, they need to be able to connect with their teacher. I, I wish I could tell you that all teachers are proactive and supportive of their students. There's always going to be that one that has that heavy sigh when the student comes in. Um, and giving the students that support, letting them know they can come back to their counselor in their, in their disability service office because they, they'll be their advocate to help them. But the student also needs to be able to speak up for themselves. They need to... Um, express what's what's causing that concern or that barrier because our goal is for students to be successful we want to be their cheerleaders all of these people want to be their cheerleaders and stand there and watch them graduate when they're done um but the student needs to to welcome them in and and accept their support um in class eight i gotta say um that was one i struggled with as a student um, because that is one where it left me kind of feeling other. So, uh, in my own education, I did not use them in class eight. I probably had some things that could have been done easier if I had, but it was, that was a point of pride for me. Now, having said that, um, one of the things I would do at PCC when I would hear a student repeatedly telling me they were struggling is I would just... <laughs> Because you get free classes. I just take the class. Like, okay, well, what exactly is going on? Um, so I've learned a lot about, you know, a lot more and more of our schools are relying on third-party content, uh, things from Pearson and whatnot. And uh, there are times when there is no other choice but to have that in class A to support those tools. Uh, I wish that our schools would step away from that stuff. That's an area of advocacy that we all need to work on. Uh, but as long as schools are paying for stuff that is not accessible, we need to find a way to make sure our students can um, access it and be successful uh, in their education. And that's that. Thank you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. So now uh, this is the part I've been waiting for, uh, where the three of us can just chat uh, about uh, things we've discussed so far. So the in-class aides, we were leaving off there. So I was coordinating in-class aides, but I also support the community college. And um, one thing that came up a lot was kind of the differences between working with an in-class aide at the college versus working with like a paraeducator in K-12. And um, one thing that came up kind of over and over again is at the college, the in-class aides are there to perform very specific tasks. So it would be things like, they could read things off the whiteboard for you. They could read your text for you if you weren't able to do that. They could write things for you. They could like manipulate physical things and they could take notes. That was basically it. And students were um, kind of in some circumstances kind of uh, expecting their aid to remind them to pay attention or remind them about upcoming due dates. And some things that we see kind of paraeducators in K-12 doing um, more frequently. And so that was a surprise for some students. And so I think that is good for students to know and also for K-12 professionals to be thinking about um, supporting para paraprofessionals and, and kind of taking a step back from our students and letting them develop their own skills and their own kind of autonomy because they're not going to get that same level of support when they go to higher ed. Um, we, the testing center is kind of a, an interesting thing, I think, as well for our students. Um, a lot of times our students um, need extended time for assessments. And um, in the K-12 environment, there's kind of different ways to achieve that. But in higher ed, we're, we're frequently just doing that through the testing centers. So that would mean scheduling your testing time in advance, 
um, making uh, that extra time available in your schedule to go use that extended time in the testing center and then working with readers and scribes um, while you're there. So kind of thinking about how that's going to impact your day-to-day -day, um, study habits and uh, your time at the college. Um, JJ, is there anything we missed from your kind of instructor perspective when you're at the college or any thoughts you have? Um, yeah, that role of the instructor, like, you know, you and Patricia as well have familiarity with um, some instructors are much more willing to uh, do what they are supposed to do for the student and some are not. <laughs> and so the student having to um, just realize that uh, advocacy piece for themselves and communication with disability services to get assistance with that and or vet work with disability services to vet instructors for courses that they know are going to be much more willing to um, coordinate and collaborate for the access uh, is is it's it's a both and it's kind of unfortunate that not all instructors are like that but also it's and there are instructors that are and so if you can utilize those instructors as well i also um wanted to there was a something we've talked about that i wanted to bring up michael where um you had commented before about making sure students understand that maybe they really enjoy uh being in class and want to make sure they have an in-class experience all the time with an instructor, but that's not a guarantee anymore at the college level. Uh, more often than not, classes are hybrid um, at least, and they will all have an online component. And sometimes you do show up for a class and find out that the vast majority of the class is going to be online. So um, doing some work there with folks at, at the college level and with disability services to navigate and figure out um, what class, what courses those may be. And if you, you can change your, they might know. Uh, courses absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it is really essential for today's college students to have strong computer skills because even if they are taking in-person classes, most of the uh, instructors want them to upload their assignments to their, to their uh, DTL. Uh, portal or whatever basis, whatever uh, ah, site they're using uh, for uh, content at their schools. Yeah, and I think I, a lot of what I would see um, was you, you show up to class in person for your math class, but all of your homework is through an online interface and even your, your, court, your classwork uh, is through an online platform. Um, so you really do need to have this really strong web skills. Um, there's one thing I forgot to mention earlier, which is that um, Braille transcribers are, are, are in kind of access to people who have Braille knowledge is uh, much more readily available in K-12. In higher education, Braille transcribers are few and far between. You can have Braille materials and your school can go out and want to order those from a transcriber um, or for a Braille production house, um, but not necessarily, it's not necessarily that you're going to have it uh, on your campus or somebody who can transcribe all of your math materials or something like that. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, you might not necessarily have someone who can interpret your Nemeth uh, Braille or something like that. Which is another reason why you should request your accommodations as early as possible, because if they are having to outsource material requests, it's going to take longer. And we really want you to have your, your materials that your state classes and the other state classes. And then uh, finally, I will add uh, that I wish every school had a, a Deb or Patricia who's ready to go take a course to see what the student experience is really like and how we can improve things. I think that's excellent. I would love to see more of that. So <laughs> kudos to both of you. Uh, I think we're, we're running right up on the, um, the end of our time. But if folks have questions, um, you can put them in the chat or we can unmute. And I think we're going to be transitioning to the next session shortly. So much great information, and I just love learning uh, about populations that before uh, it, it always seemed like there was a, um, a itinerant, visually impaired uh, uh, support, and that was always taken care of. 
And so now learning some of these inner workings of things that we really should know uh, to help in making these things more universal. And we know that just recently there's some st new strong regulations out about web accessibility and in higher ed in particular. Um, and when we talk about hybrid classes, uh, JJ, I, I see Patricia and I hear her say, oh, the uh, the chat just uh, blew up in my ear. And so we, when we are mindful that we have persons in our classes and in our sessions, um, is there a, a, some quick tips about making our hybrid world and in particular our virtual world more friendly um, for persons with visual impairment? Um, so there are settings, I, I could have turned off the, the chat if so it wasn't reading it to me, but since I was a presenter, I, I wanted to be able to hear it, but as a student, they could, but then that's going to limit. Um, so if there's like a good discussion going on in, in the chat, you, you would want to, as the facilitator, make a point of mentioning it. So, uh, so that blind student, if they've turned off the chat so they can focus on you, will have that information. Yeah, so maybe like stopping and summarizing the chat might be nice, like uh, like JJ did for us earlier. Um, and the, for web platforms, it's, it's just really important that schools are kind of doing their due diligence and really vetting these programs and their accessibility um, because the, the sales pitch you get from vendors doesn't always paint the full picture. And so it's important that schools are kind of in really investigating um, is this platform accessible? Is it gonna be usable with kind of various AT that our students are using? And are we doing all that footwork before we commit to purchasing a product and not focusing so much on remediation after the fact? 